happening in the real world of, of airlines and airports. And of course, you know, we don't need to um, go over the situation because I think we all know where we are. But I think it's important that we we just highlight a little bit about, you know, the resilience of our industry, because I think that's what will bring this 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 industry back to the forefront again. As all of us knew, by the end of 2019, we really didn't know what we know today. And the aviation industry was at um, at an all time high, like many industries. Let's let's be honest. You know, the last years between 15 to 19, there was very good growth in in aviation, and that that's both the airlines and the airport side. So if we just looked at the the, the last year compared to 18. Revenue per kilometer was up 5%. GDP, so how we measure countries' uh, growth, was up just under 3%, slightly down, but still a very good figure. Um, we employed uh, a significant amount of people. Load factors were, were good. You know, 82% is the average. As some of you may know, the low costs might get up as high as 90 to 95% load factor, but taking all airlines across all different um, types of, of models. And it was a 10th year of profitability. So, of course, we all expected 2020 to continue in the same, um, the same way. Now, obviously, what the question is, is does 22 and 23, do we go back to where we were? Now, that, that we just don't know because we're still somewhat... Um, within this pandemic, even though we do believe that we're getting um, closer to some sort of end, at least in relation to people being able to travel. And, you know, I think if we went back to 2020, not knowing that this would continue as long as maybe it is doing, we were also starting to go back to other um, periods of challenge. And, you know, we were all saying, well, we've seen this all before. We, you know, we had oil crisis. We've had the Gulf crisis. We had the 9-11. We had SARS. We had the financial crisis. And, you know, throw throw as much crisis as you can at aviation, but they, it keeps bouncing back. And Airbus were actually showing that from the end of this period, 2019, that we were looking to be growing at around 4% per year up until 2033. So everything was ready for our industry to be exploding and growing. And of course, the pandemic arrived. And, and that's one of my questions, you know, do we come through this with a difference? Maybe that's what we'll try to discuss as we go through. Where, where, why we'll be growing, I think, was important. Well, of course, aviation had changed dramatically in the 90s, particularly starting in the in the US, where low cost development um, was in the hands of the of airlines. You know, we named them Southwest, etc., which created this model of being able to fly people. Um, at a very affordable price. And Europe picked up that trend. And you really look at the growth of aviation from the 2000s through to 2010, um, where, where you know, the likes of Ryanair and EasyJet really, really enabled European travel to become as strong as it was by the end of 2019. And at that point, Europe was around 42% of its traffic was in what we might call low cost. So interestingly that the US was the start, but by by um, the time Europe had discovered low cost, we'd actually grown more this model of travel than the American had grown it. And then there was a trend really from 2000 and well, I'd say 2010, um, when Asia really started to think strongly about how can low cost also be a, a new model? Um, South Asia, which is India, um, was a real bellwether for this project. They said that you know we had very important um, 
one billion population. People had not had access to travel for a long time other than by train or by road. It took a long time. The country was big. And India really took low cost strategies from Europe. And now at the end of 2019, they were around 60 percent of their traffic was in the hands of the low costs. And Southeast Asia, which is their Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, etc., they're even better. So they've even gone further. Probably the most interesting in this slide is, is, the, is, the, is the very low penetration in two of the biggest markets for aviation, which would be Russia and China. Um, that's a reflection on the politics of, of, of private aviation, because as we know, most of the low cost penetration was done through private airlines, not government owned airlines the same way where what we've seen both with Russia and China is more protectionism on state airlines. So in Russia, obviously, Aeroflot is the main airline, governs most of the flying for Russian airspace. Um, and obviously in China, there are three major airlines, China Eastern, China Southern, and Air China. They're all owned by the government. And so there's been a little bit more protectionism in these two major markets. And that's why we've seen low cost not as strong. Interestingly, both during the, 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 the pandemic have been quite closed, as you know, in terms of their border controls, et cetera. And both of them have started to actually penetrate stronger low cost, but focusing on the domestic markets. So within Russia, Aeroflot created their own low cost airline which has now started to take quite a strong strategy within Russia. And within China, the government encouraged a, a, a private airline called Spring Airlines to really grow during the pandemic and provide domestic travel. So the low cost model, I think, will come through the pandemic. And if we look at the pandemic where we were 2020 and 2021, actually, when countries were open, and we know some opened, some didn't, etc., the airlines that were the most um, relevant during the pandemic have actually been the low cost. So again, closer to home here in Europe, during the pandemic, we saw very large growth plans coming out of Ryanair and also from the Eastern European airline Wizz Air was also very strong in, in opening new routes and believing that low cost strategies will be very successful post the pandemic. Why? I think it proved that the, the low cost model, it's very easy to work if countries were open. So if, if you look at um, Middle East, as an example, if you look at Emirates with a strategy of connecting Asia to Europe over Dubai, well, as you know, there's been a lot of Asia, China, Singapore, Korea, Japan, they've been closed in inbound, outbound for really 16 to 17 months. So what that then meant is if you were an airline that was connecting Chinese to the UK over Dubai, you didn't have one part of your leg operating. And I think what the model of the low cost, which is focus on point to point flying, you know, um, Manchester to Paris or, 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 or London to Zurich, etc., point to point. That model has worked as countries have allowed people to travel. So if the UK space was open and the Spanish space was open, you can fly UK Spain. So there's been a lot quicker um, regeneration of the low cost strategy than there has been of the legacy airline model. And this pretty much mirrors that. There was also a, an, an emerging project that had really taken hold since 2015, which was actually to take the low cost model and fly it further. So there was this perception that you only flew low costs between two to four hours rather than flying seven to 12 hours, as an example. But actually what we started to see just before the pandemic was a real push for airlines to say we can fly further with um, low cost models. And we've seen the emergence of 10 new airlines 
coming to our into our space to provide travel of up to 12 hours at, at what we call low cost fares. During the pandemic, these models suffered strongly and they, they pretty much were, were closed immediately. There's now talk that this model might come back. And we've seen two, two new startups during the pandemic um, within the Scandinavian market. So one in Iceland um, or, or two based in Iceland, but, but one also based within um, Sweden to try to now drive North America to Europe on a on a long haul low cost model. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not this will come back as fast as it was during the pre pandemic level. So I think what I'm saying in this first introduction is that we've been resilient in the past. Obviously, what what we've seen with the pandemic is far greater than we've ever known. Um, so we can't compare with with 9/11 or with SARS or with the oil crisis, because this has been a completely different um, level of pandemic and reflection on aviation. But what we're now trying to understand is what can we learn from this, and what's what we've learned quickly is that leisure travel um, has worked when borders have been opened. Low cost airlines have worked because they're more flexible in the way that they operate. And where we're still not sure is what might be the future of corporate travel and what might be the future of hubs. So these are kind of slightly challenging times because we don't know whether or not the corporate traveler will come back in the same dimension. Has this new technology, Zoom, Teams, enable people to make business with technology or do we go and say no there's nothing like being in front of the person that we need to negotiate with and we will see business travel come back as we get more stable destinations and what will be this vision of um, airlines flying via destinations there is some discussions about having more direct operations and more point-to-point -point operations. So what damage might that do to the airlines that are very heavily focused in, in the hub and spoke model? And of course, that by default, we would then look at the Middle East. We'd look at Dubai with Emirates and look at Doha um, with Qatar Airways. And, you know, what might that be? You probably, we, we even had a third airline in this project, with, which was called Etihad, based in Abu Dhabi. But during the pandemic, they really took the opportunity to downsize and not focus as much on being the third major global hub player in the Middle East. So you've really now got Dubai with Emirates and uh, Qatar um, with, uh, with the Doha project. So will, will low, long haul low cost come back? If leisure is growing fast, maybe. And this is all part of what, what to try and understand as we move forward. Another major change was how airlines were starting to consider their strategies on, on route planning, and particularly in terms of their network. We, we, we were very much involved with what we could call narrow body and wide body. So a narrow body aircraft would be 170 seats flying two to three hours, which we, you would know with the Ryanair and the EasyJet model. And then we very much had the what we call the wide body model, which was either um, A330 or the Boeing 787, which are around 250 to 300 seats, or it was the 747 uh, Boeing or the A380 from Airbus, which were between 400 to 600 seats. So we kind of had these narrow body, wide body. The wide body changed quite dramatically during the pandemic. Why? Because four engined aircraft, which is what the Boeing um, 747 and the A380 were flying with, we realized quite quickly that that's very expensive because of fuel. Um, and also, as we have to be more sustainable, 
it's going to be much more efficient to fly with two engines. And so during the pandemic, a lot of the long, what we call legacy airlines, British Airways, Lufthansa, Air France, et cetera, realized that it was a good time to remove some of these larger aircraft, the four engine wide bodies, and some cases not replace them because they realized it was also a downsizing opportunity to make some cuts within their companies, but to replace them with newer versions. So we, we know with the A350, which is Airbus's um, kind of opportunity now with 350 seats with two engines. And basically what will still to come to market, which is the Boeing 777 from um, out of Seattle, which will fly up to 12 to 13 hours, again, with around 350 to 400 seats. So we're going a little bit less with the with the, the, the wide bodies, but we're going a little bit further in where they can fly. In the middle, there was nothing. So you either had planes for three to five hours, or you had planes for kind of the eight to 12 hours. What we're now seeing is a very important new project, and this is going to be a game changer for a lot of airlines and a lot of countries as well as we as we come through the pandemic. What we're basically looking at here is a, is a mixture between a wide body distance, so a plane that can fly as much as nine, 10 hours, but only a single aisle structure. So we're basically talking of a plane with around 150 to 180 seats that can fly basically from New York to London, or it can fly um, from Paris to Dubai, as an example. So this is, an, this is opening up what we call secondary markets, where you don't have 300 and 350 people but it also allows you to have routes where you don't need to fly with larger aircraft. So we have the 21 long range from Airbus and we have the MAX. Finally, the MAX was given permission to restart after the crisis with Ethiopian and Lion Air. And so we've now got a kind of a mixed airline, a product that gives you distance, but it doesn't give you all of the heavy costs of having to carry 300 or 350 people. And this is going to be somewhat a great opportunity for airlines to try and play a little bit with, with leisure. And particularly, let, let's experiment with certain routes where we didn't have demand for 350 people, but we can create demand for 160 people. And as it's a longer flight, eight, nine hours, you may actually get a good yield. Yield, as you know, is the price you pay per seat because you've got good capacity of good seat offer. You know, this, this can be an opportunity for airlines not to have to discount to fill the aircraft. So there's a lot of, a lot of new vision about the post the pandemic is based upon how these airlines or these aircraft, excuse me, can work with their airline companies to really put this new vision forward. So watch this space. There's a lot of orders. Um, you know, the big American companies, United Airlines, American Airlines, they've ordered 50 each of these new aircraft. Um, some of the big, the big guys in the Middle East and in India have ordered up to 50 of these aircraft as well. So it's, it's a real big change in the way we might look at long travel, but with less people traveling. And it's a, it's kind of watch this space. When, when, will we, when, when will we be back? I suppose that's a question that everybody's asking themselves. And, and, you know, we're starting to see some opportunities. And for sure, if we look at capacity for summer 22, which is now starting in April, in some markets, and I'll use Europe because we're, we're, we're part of the European project, um, it's, as, it's, it's as, as good as it was back in 2019 on the capacity. What we don't know yet is whether or not that demand, people booking, will come back as strongly as it should do. As I've said, in 2019, 
we had an average load factor of 80%. And we had the Ryanairs and the EasyJets with around 92 or 93% load factor. During the pandemic, we've had load factors of around 30 or 40%. So you can see that we've really struggled to put people in aircraft. What we're now facing for 2022 is capacity is there, but we don't know if people will travel just yet. You know, there are some very good forward bookings data. So there are some of these third party uh, companies that, that produce statistics on forward bookings. And they're talking very positive that there is a lot of, we call it pent up demand. A lot of people want to travel. So we are seeing good bookings data coming through. But whether or not we'll get load factors back up into the 80s or the 90s, that's going to be a challenge because, of course, we don't want to be having load factors in the 80s and the 90s if we're selling seats below cost. One, one thing is load factor, which is how many seats you sell. The other thing that you'll be studying is yield management, which is how much do you sell per seat at? And one does not always mean the other. It's very easy for an airline to push up the load factors you just reduce the price of the tickets. And in a, in a situation like we may be facing, where there's a lot of people that want to travel, it might seem easy. Oh, let's reduce fares, get people to try to travel. But that's not profitable. And of course, what airlines are now worried about is one and a half years or two years of very low revenue, in some cases, no revenue. And the elephant in the room we, we, we forget is the price of fuel, which back in 2020, there was a period where the oil was below zero. Now we've got levels of oil going not close or, or not far from $100 for a barrel of oil, as we would say. So all of a sudden, um, airlines that are suffering because of lack of business for one and a half years are now faced with another challenge, which is very high unit costs on their fuel bill. So you can start to see that discounting tickets is not going to be sustainable as a way to come through the pandemic. Maybe it will work the other way. Maybe if you have so much demand um, and, and not all markets may be open, maybe we can have some higher fares. Maybe people will prepare to pay more to travel. Again, these are things that we don't know. And in the in the wonders of the pre-pandemic in aviation, we were very heavily using algorithms and revenue management and modeling and scenario analysis, which was analyzing data. But if you think about the algorithms in 2022, we have two years of zero in most cases. So the computers now do not know what to put because we've messed the data. So a lot of airlines are basically going back to what we did 20 years ago, which is trying to understand people's sentiments, willingness to pay, not what the computer will tell you to charge, but actually maybe going talking to customers and going in some ways we're having to go backwards to go forwards. We really don't, we, without two years of data, the algorithms that we had in the revenue systems are now useless because the predictions have all changed. If you're if you're comparing 2019 with 2020, it doesn't make sense. So we've lost a lot of our comparisons. So we need a couple of years now to build back data for the algorithms to start again. So another challenge for airlines is, is not having the systems in place as we did in the past to help predict a little bit the economics of our industry. I think another challenge that we, we've seen, and maybe the pandemic is an opportunity to be different, is that airlines had become very similar. There'd been a lot of commoditization of our sector. Why? Because we were all focusing on managing costs. So cost leadership had become the driver of aviation, which means by default, we're looking for lowest offer. 
So we've stopped investing in the product, let's say. And what we've started to do is invest in the ways to reduce costs, not enhance service, not enhance the offer. So what we've ended up really saying to each other is that we're all the same. So the airlines in the 80s and the 90s that were, were trying to be different, they're now saying, no, we haven't had investments to do that. We're, we're similar to each other. So there's kind of a commoditization. We, you know, commoditization, we use the analogy of toothpaste. That, is there any difference between these toothpastes? They all do what they're supposed to do, clean your teeth. That's, is that the same as airlines? They do what they should do. They should take you from A to B. And this is one of the dilemmas because our industry for years had been quite innovative. Airlines had taken a lot of, um, you know, they, they developed them the vision of differentiation and try to stand out from the rest. Now, maybe what I showed you, remember, with the slide of the low cost penetration, that's mirrored people's thinking because the low cost have said there's no difference. Buy on price, don't buy on service. So the fact that the low cost model has become so strong in, in, the, in the continents where our airline travel is, that's put pressure on airlines to invest in differentiation because the consumer is not willing to pay for differentiation if the mind of the consumer is aviation is low cost. So you can see there's a little bit of a, a kind of a, a, a dichotomy here between who pays for differentiation? Do customers want airlines to be different or do we want airlines to be lowest price? And maybe during the pandemic, this is a time for airlines to rethink how they want to come through. What do they want to be in 22 or 23? Is it time for airlines to change their perceptions on what they offer the market? So at the moment in this, let's call it new normal, because we've kind of just started to travel again, but we're not back yet to the levels that we know of 19. How are people thinking when they travel? Well, it's all a little bit, we're all a bit anxious. Let's say our state of mind, we, we, we know it might be a little bit of hassle, a lot of paperwork. Um, we're still a little bit scared about, you know, can you catch COVID on the aircraft? Will you get COVID in the, in the airport? Will, will there be social distancing? So there's a lot, of, a lot of questions that we don't know. And of course, not many people are traveling. So you don't have many reference points. If you ask people, have you traveled? In 2019, every other person's probably traveled. If you ask that same audience today, how many people have traveled? It's probably two, 3%. So our core peer group is not traveling. So people are not familiar with what's been happening. The other state that we're in is obviously some people now want simplicity. We in before twenty before the COVID, there was a belief that uh, we were giving a lot of offer. You know, you know, there were multiple multiple products on offer. During the pandemic, we've been a little bit more simplistic. Now, what does that mean for aviation post pandemic? Do we do we need as much offer? Um, meaning, you know, how do we engage with our passengers? How do we engage with distribution? These are good questions to be asking because maybe the future of travel needs to be less complicated. How do you, you know, how can you how to buy an air ticket? Can we buy an air ticket in the future in a supermarket or on the mul on the machine of the bank? Why do we have to go to a travel agent to buy a ticket? Why do we have to go to a website to buy a ticket? Can we not buy in other channels? So do we make it more simple or do we make it more complicated? These are key challenges that are facing airlines as they try to understand what next. At the moment, we're a little bit worried about travel. So the, when people are worried, you should try to make it as easy as possible. So at the moment, we're in this state of mind of anxiety and simplicity. In 23, maybe we're not so anxious to travel. So maybe it's an opportunity then to think what next.
in how people are acting. And we we need to we need to communicate. Let let let's be honest. A lot of airlines have been suffering. They've been reducing their staff. They've been closing operations. And that's put pressure on communication. You know, a lot of the industry hasn't been speaking because you don't you didn't want to be presenting projects at the same time that the company was downsizing. So there's been a little bit of um, it's been quiet. Airlines have been quiet. And so it's at some point we need to start re to recommunicating, representing our products and our offer. Um, I think we hear I see here two major opportunities. One is about taking we need to be we need to take care and concern of passengers and make sure that you know we we make it as easy as is as possible for people to travel the last thing we want to be doing is making complications for people and trying because people blame the airlines they don't blame the governments so i think the question all about testing and about applications and and, and vaccination certificates and all of these words that have been passed around for the last year, we need to try and understand how do we make that transition quicker and easier. And who is our community? Who are it's not just travelers now, it's also our own people. You know, we've 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 sent we've sent people to work in conditions where we didn't know if COVID might still be being spread on aircraft. So I think you know there's been a little bit of it's care and concern for the passengers. But it's care and concern again for those who are, who are part of the company. So it's kind of a little bit of, you know, time to reflect a little bit on, you know, it's not about shouting profitability and success. It's about we're reopening and we are opening in a new way. And it's also about on the other side, this opportunity to be flexible. Pre-pandemic airlines, we were very um, traditional particularly when it came to the booking systems. If you wanted to have flexibility with your ticket, you'd have to pay more money. You know, there was always a price to be paid for flexibility. What we're now starting to look at is because of the pandemic, how do I, what might happen if I can't travel? Can I get my money back? How easy will it be to be reimbursed by the airline? And these are questions that before the pandemic, we didn't, we never wanted to reimburse. If you bought a ticket that was low fare, you probably had no rights to any cancellation. If you cancel, you lose everything. You know, and now it's changed. People want flexibility. And at some point, airlines have not charged for that. That's been part of the, their added value. Just in case the government says you can't travel, we would offer you a refund. They wouldn't have done that before the pandemic. You'd have bought your own insurance for such a, a change in travel. Now that kind of insurance is the airline saying, OK, book a ticket. And if it doesn't happen, we'll give you the conditions as if you'd bought a very high fare ticket like we had in the past. So there's been a lot of agility. Let's call it agility and flexibility by airlines to try to present themselves to customers, passengers, with a little bit more, I'm ready to change. Whether or not that will continue 23, 24, or do airlines go back to what they were doing in the past, which is if you want flexibility, you pay a higher fare, because the more you pay, the, the easier it is to change or refund. If you buy a low fares ticket, you have to travel on a certain plane, and on a certain date. And if you don't, then maybe we don't give you any difference. So change is always good for everybody. It allows airlines to think a little bit differently. OK, moving that on. So what's value in the pandemic or post the pandemic? In the, in the olden days, 2019, what I show here in this little um, matrix is that pr price, is an addition on your costs. So this is this is how much it cost. This is what I charge you, and that's my margin. What we might start really to see post the pandemic is we've just been mentioning about people are more anxious, people are not as risk adverse to travel. 
you need to make your travel with even greater value than the other. And that value is the difference between why I fly with your airline or why I fly with the other airline. And that value can sometimes be emotional value. It may not be physical. And you know it. It's that, it's that perception. I'm prepared to pay a little bit more for something because I feel confident to pay more just in case. And I think this is an area where the airlines might start to use this emotional axis value as a way not to be discounting as they were before the pandemic. So as we were constantly in price wars in 2018, 2019, and being very honest, in some cases, airlines were not all profitable. What we've seen now with the pandemic is maybe we might change a little bit and actually start to look for value added offer and say to people, yeah, you will pay more with me, but this is the reason why you should pay more. These are the benefits you'll get with me, which are better than the benefits you get with my competitor. So these are the kind of things that airlines are now trying to understand. The value of differentiation and will people pay for that? Because that changes the narrative. It moves people from cost to looking at value which means price changes. When you're talking about cost, price is low. When you're talking about value, price is what you're prepared to pay for something that you think will make your life better or easier or safer. So this is why we're trying to understand what is value post the pandemic when people travel. Flexibility is going to be part of that. Reassurance will be part of that. The belief that, you know, things can change will be part of that. So this idea of not sticking to one thing only, but being flexible to the market is what's going to make an airline be in a position to price on value and not just focus on margin which is basically how much can I charge above my costs? So major change ahead when we talk about value. So to finalize this first part, which is mainly on the airline side, four steps to run an airline post a pandemic. The first one is how to manage your costs. As I've been saying, fuel is going up. So we now have got a major part of our unit costs we need to look at. What can we change within our operations? How can we um, try to be different? How do we win back customers that may not have traveled? And will they come back and travel with us or will they travel and try out maybe one of our competitors? And how do we win the game on distribution? Where, how to make airline travel accessible, where you can book it? So putting it into the touch points that are most convenient to the travelers and not convenient to the companies selling airlines. And maybe that's where we've got to think differently about how we position aviation in the likes of a supermarket. How do you buy tickets via an, uh, a bank machine, etc.? Not having to buy only online or in a travel agent. Where else can we look for ease and simplicity in booking tickets? Okay, so I'll, I'll take a just 10, 20 second break um, and then we will just have a quick look at, so what's the airports change post the pandemic? So 2019, looking at the power of an airport, who held that power? The airports themselves? Who were in control in 2019? Airports, airlines, or passengers? Well, airlines were growing. So that meant that airlines wanted to be placing their aircraft. Airports were getting more and more constrained on growth because of concerns of environmental, concerns with significant growth over many years, 
And you actually got to the situation where in 2019, having access to some of the bigger airports in the world was getting difficult. Slots were hard to find. Gates and, and times of departure and arrival were hard to find. And actually, airports were able to negotiate with airlines. Look at, this is my landing charges. These are my costs. And start to be a little bit more aggressive in the way they handle their airline counterparts. And started to kind of highlight that as they were getting more busy, there was less bargaining power for the airline. You want to land? This is my charges. Take it or leave it. That's kind of where we're going. We've seen airports take a very strong position in bargaining power with airlines and passengers. Obviously, where you didn't have a competitor airport, so if you only had one airport in the city, by default, the airport also had the power because you weren't picking the airport out of choice. You were picking the airport because you were picking the airline. The airline just happened to use that airport. But in those cases where there was more than one airport, then obviously the airports had to try to make their differentiation different than the competitor airport. But generally, airports were in control. So that meant that they were kind of driven by growth from both airlines and from passengers. And there was a lot of push as airports got busier that meant more selling opportunities to people whilst they were in the airports. So what we could call non-aviation revenue, so monies that you make from the airline's passenger will be, excuse me, were becoming the driver of where airports were making their money. More than 50% of airlines' revenue had started to come from passengers and not from airlines. So this was a, a major shift in the model of airports. Airports in the past made money from airlines and airports at the end of, or right towards the end or, be, or the start of the pandemic, airports were, were making money out of um, airlines wanting to grow. As airlines wanted to grow, you would pay more to have your vision with my airport. So very interesting times. 2020 arrived, the pandemic, and airports have suffered badly because there's been no, in many cases, there's been no flights. And as you've got no flights and you had half of your business was in the passengers that were flying, you can see why airports have suffered badly because you haven't had arrivals. So you haven't had anybody spending any money. You haven't had departures in the same way either. So you've started to see a kind of a double whammy from an, from an airport. No revenue from airlines. And as airlines, are, and they're not bringing passengers, no revenue from passengers. So airports have suffered badly. And throw in the mix, in the period between... 2015 until the pandemic, one of the fastest growing industry sectors was privatization of airports. So airports were now owned by private companies. And why they put money into these units was because they believed that the guaranteed revenue from the non-aviation was going to continue to grow as aviation was growing. And now, of course, you've had two years of no aviation which has meant you've had no, no aviation, non-aviation. So that's why you can start to see dramatically how airports are suffering. The future is about trying to be more together, um, what I could call understanding the EU, aligning airlines and airports much closer. Airports need to change. They need to focus a little bit more on where they can make success. They need to understand how to work better with their airline partners and how to provide an enhanced passenger experience. 
They can't sit there and say, I have no competition, so it doesn't matter. Because in some cases there are more than one airport, but in many cases there aren't. So where they've got monopoly airports, it's, it's unfair to think like this. I don't have to change because at the end of the day, the passenger has to come through my airport. But they're not coming through with any real drive to support your non-aviation revenue. So focus has to be a key part of that. The way airports work has to change. In this pandemic, what we've seen, those that have traveled, 40% of the travel has been made to go in the next one to two days. That would have been about five to 10% before the pandemic. We didn't, we've taken the chance to travel now if a border opens tomorrow, we go in the next day. So the amount of last minute travel has been driven by change of legislation. But at some point that has enabled airlines to have to change and airports need to change also. Planning has to change. We normally plan a long way ahead. Why can't we plan for next week? Why do we have to be planning routes for one year ahead? If the market knows of the route and we have the distribution ready to be sent to the right channels, why can we not launch flights during the season? Why do we have to wait for the start of the summer or the start of the winter season to say we're going to start flying? You know, that was the, that was the model of history. The model of the future is more about being prepared to work quickly. And how are people looking to travel? How are they booking travel? It's all online. We know that because shops are being shut. Travel agents are being closed. So people have been searching information. Price comparison data is telling you where people are booking. Are more people now booking for Spain or for Greece for the half term holidays in the UK at the moment? That information is available. So if I'm if I knew this information a few weeks ago, did I start putting new capacity to Greece and not Spain? Because I could see trends picking up that people wanted to have holidays now in certain places. And we need to be checking social media. How are people talking about destinations? What's the buzzwords about destinations? So we need to be on top of our demand. Don't wait for the demand to come. Go out there and chase the demand is what I'm saying. Flexibility, as I've just mentioned, used to be six to eight months of scheduling. We pick a route, we have to schedule, we have to say when we're going to fly, what day of the week, what time. Then we need to assign the fleet. Do we make sure the plane is not being in a maintenance check on those days? Then we have to find crew and then we have to put crew on the calendar so they know they're going to be traveling. That was six to eight months. Now we need that done in four to six weeks and even maybe below four to six weeks. Maybe we can do it in two to four weeks is even better. Because as long as people are starting, to, people, as long as people have the opportunity to book at last minute, then we can make the challenge on operations work at last minute as well. So this is a major change and a major opportunity. People don't sit down anymore the same way. Think differently about how people are traveling. And that leads really to, to, to one of my last slides so I can open up for any questions, which is digitalization. You know, everybody is talking about digitalization. How can we digitalize within the airport and the transportation sector? We should be able to customize your trip and maybe now how we can work with security lines, with the airlines themselves, we can try to make sure that we, we can create a seamless application that allows you to monitor your journey. Where are you in your journey and what might happen next? So you're, you're managing your journey on your own. That will be very interesting. How can we digitalize to make more money? One of the ways to make money is to not give everything as part of the flight ticket. So the model of the low cost was that if you want to take luggage, you might have to pay for that. If you wanted to eat or drink, you would pay for that. If you wanted to board the plane quicker so you could get space for your luggage, you'd pay for that. If you wanted to book seats together, 
you'd pay for that. These are what we call ancillaries, extras, let's call them extras. That is a huge opportunity in post-pandemic. Maybe people don't want to pay as much, but they'll pay for things that they think they need. So I think this is an opportunity for digitalization to really drive airline thinking for the future. I mentioned before about the loss of data. So we have what we call lifetime value. Who were our good customers? Well, if they didn't fly in 2021, that's not because they they were bad customers. They just couldn't travel. So lifetime value was always about um, enhancing the best customer. You don't actually know who your best customers are in the same way today. How to improve support? So building up contact centers, et cetera, that drive people to more personalized responses. And I'm not talking here about chat bots. No, I'm talking about personalized conversations with your front facing staff. And finally, to help in the next crisis, because if we do now, maybe we get better as we move forward. Um, Moving to touchless travel, I think you all know what this means. You know, how can we try to use the pandemic as a way to digitalize better? So we've do, we've done it in the booking. So you can do your online booking, you do online check-in. And now we're trying to move that to other parts of the airport experience where you do your own check-in of your luggage and you do your own security and information protocols. So Building, building on this belief that you have touchless travel, now it's touchless travel through the airport as well. So touchless travel was very much built into the booking platforms. Now it's touchless travel in the airport platforms. People don't need to touch anything to be able to manage their relationship with an airport. Now that's not as positive to an airport, because if you don't communicate, you can't share information with customers. So in one way, it's good for the customer because it's quicker, but it stops communication if people are not talking to each other in the security, et cetera. So finally, airports at the moment, what's going on? It's about making the experience safer, easier, and reducing the fear in the, in the consumer's mind. And it's also about trying to move, not rewarding people because they may not be traveling as much anymore, but recognizing your best customers. And one equals the other. If we know more about you for the future, we can make your experience better. And that is where I will I will leave it. So just to highlight on the airline side, some work being done to really understand how to manage costs, build back the brand story, and try and work the right vision. And on the airport side, it's very much about building back with a belief that airports are safe and that airports are a way for you to access um, that information that's needed or those products that are needed in a very efficient and um, kind of self-restrained way, making life easy, removing hassle during an airport experience. So I think at that point, Eric, I will I will stop so that we can open up for five minutes, 10 minutes of some questions. If we have any questions, I will stop my, my sharing. Um, and we can go from there if anybody wants to add anything or ask anything. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gavin. I really enjoy your <laughs> lecture. Really, very, uh, very rich and very insightful. Quite a lot of things uh, about airport and airline uh, strategy going forward. So guys, any questions? Uh, yeah, Ahmed, yeah. <laughs> it's just, uh, Good afternoon, Ahmed. Well, I was uh, applauding, but uh, oh, have you got any questions? It was applaud. Sorry, I thought <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was waving <laughs> for, for, the Thank you for the lecture. I was an applaud. I see. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. It was a great lecture. Thank you very much. Excellent. Any any question, guys? Maybe uh, uh, 
Kevin, have you, um, do you know of any airport uh, which has implemented these touchless, uh, touchless travel so far in their premises? Certainly Dubai, because as you know, during the pandemic, the, one of the only countries that was kind of open was the UAE. And so Dubai put a lot of new technologies um, through their systems, particularly in the in body scanning. So they had uh, body scan tunnels, as they were calling them, to try and understand uh, your heat maps, to try and see if, you know, this was the earlier days of COVID. So we weren't, mm -hmm. you know, we weren't vaccinated so much in those days. So there was that kind of drive to look at heat mapping in, in tunnels. That the immigration is all done now via biometrics if you've pre-registered. So if you're a if you're a frequent traveler to the UAE, you can go on and, and register yourself. So when you arrive, you don't have to wait in line to speak to the immigration officer. Your your iris will be your 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 eye is your iris and that's you. So you're coming in or not to the, the UAE. The, with the baggage drop, yes, Emirates implemented a system where you did your own self-scanning, um, printed out your own code and, and uploaded that to an app if you so that you didn't even need to touch paper. Again, yeah. when we were worried that this was not just an airborne disease. So I think Dubai is one of the pioneers because they I mean, there was a lot of things being done up to the pandemic, mainly in you know, the whole area of check-in and that that had become a very, uh, in a way, airlines and airports had talked together about having common platforms for people to do the check-in online. And then if you're just with hand luggage, self-scanning as, as well. But on the immigration side, that that's a little bit more complicated because you've got to bring the ministries of, of different uh, you know, you, you, the airport is could be a private company, and you're now talking to the ministries of of government affairs, and 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 immigration is always a difficult subject. So yes, that 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 takes more uh, work to be done. And the next one, obviously, is is in the the whole area of of receiving luggage, because again, there seems to be a an opportunity to try and make. Um, the the the, the ar arrival procedures on luggage needs to probably be that that's got to be looked at and can that become more um a, a, a better experience because i think if if you look at a lot of a lot of the airport development has been to remove kind of queues and and wait times mm -hmm. and i think the area that's still the worst would be in the arrivals of luggage if you if you have luggage that is an area that could could do with some further um, development. Of course, at the moment, the air, like the airports would say that that's non-revenue generating for them. Excellent. Um, Thank you, Rose. Whilst people are waiting, some of them might go and buy something. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, think about exactly. the non-aviation. Yes, exactly, yes. If your luggage arrives, you know, I think Singapore had this, they always said that your luggage should arrive within 10 minutes of the plane landing. It, you know, it was... In some cases, you might, as an airport operator, say, no, we don't want that because that means nobody might go and buy a coffee or, exactly. or do something yeah. whilst they may have to wait half an hour for their luggage. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. yeah, but we're getting closer, I think, to, and I think Dubai has been really pioneering in the pandemic on the non-person project. Excellent. We have a question in the chat. Uh, so two of our students are working on uh, urban air mobility. And okay. and one has just put a question in the chat, and he's asking, "What is your view on urban air mobility? So EV, EVTOL, uh, do you think UAM will be trend the trend for the future? So the the urban air mobility. I'm not an expert. I'm a more commercial um, aviation person. So yes, I. I know about it, and I think, of course, it. You know, there's, there's, there are projects. I know Emirates is doing a major project to create the Uber, the Uber of the skies, and pods will take you up and down. Um, I think, yes, it will come. Um, you know, there was always talk years and years ago about helicopter travel, and it never really took off. The importance of using helicopters to move people around quickly, etc., and. Uh, 
for some reason it, it never happened. Now, whether or not is this a is this a curve that will go beyond um, what helicopters could not do, which is offer that very fast urban up and down project. But I think I know a lot of the uh, manufacturers are very committed to it. Obviously, to the airlines, it's they're not so committed because it's a different type of project. You know, it's not something commercial airlines uh, have much experience with. Um, but I think, yes, that it's inevitable that, that you will things will change. And those cities where you have significant uh, needs for moving quickly around, then it could easily be a, a thing for the future for sure, for sure. But I say I'm, it's not my core expertise, so uh, I'm talking myself, not not from expertise knowledge. Thank you, Kevin. That's really um, interesting. Um, any any more question from your side? Yeah. Just a final qu question from my side, um, Gavin. You mentioned the uh, locus carrier penetration. And then, you know, Africa had a 15% penetration rate of low-cost carrier in the figure. Yep. And, and they have the same problem as Russia and, and you know, other countries in terms of uh, government protectionism of uh, um, uh, flag carriers. So my question was, if you take out of this picture the uh, airline uh, flowing from Europe to North America, North Africa, and the South African uh, low cost carrier, uh, you probably will have like a very low figure, right? So, or to put it differently, these are not airline, low cost airline base in Africa. This includes some uh, no, airline. Be, yeah. And it would be because, as you say, that the, 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 the majority of that 15% is South Africa. Yes, yeah, South Africa. So and some, covering basically Africa in South Africa. You're right. I mean, there was. There's a fascinating case study of 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 EasyJet. EasyJet, a spin-off company, was created called FastJet, and uh, and and FastJet was um, a former board member of EasyJet left, went yes. to the banks, put together a business case to say we could we should take EasyJet model to Africa, and I think in the original days it was uh, going to be in Angola. Um, in Tanzania, Tanzania and and another one. Um, I think there was another country they they Zimbabwe picked. There were Zimbabwe. That's correct. Yes. There were three three markets where they where they wanted to explore this this project. And the first thing that they realized was that one of the one of the differences between a low cost and the traditional airline European model of EasyJet is that EasyJet carries no tar no cargo. And the benefit of not taking cargo means that you can turn the aircraft around within 15 to 20 minutes because you just you're loading palleted luggage, mm -hmm. which is very different than loading palleted cargo. Yes. So the model of what airlines are, airline operations have is a project called contribution per block hour. So how how many hours can your aircraft be flying? And the the, the low cost model should say between 11, 11 to 13 hours a day, mm -hmm. you should be flying your aircraft. Now, if you have 20 minute turnarounds, it means you can do what they call waves of travel. So for instance, I'm just taking now, let's say London Nice as a good example. You could do four sectors in the morning and four sectors in so London Nice, Nice London, London Nice, Nice London in the morning, and then the same in the afternoon as a way and that will cover your 11 to 14 hours of, of, of block hour. Mm. If you start putting cargo on, you don't have as many waves, mm. which means you're not as efficient. And so the first thing that FastJet said is that we want cargo, which meant the whole block hour project changed. Mm. So you were no longer flying to put passengers as the driver of the business model, where you were trying to shuttle planes backwards and forwards, one hour, two hour, it was now actually starting to look at where were the cargo routes. To, so the model straight away changed, which wasn't what EasyJet had created. They were non-cargo. And then you rightly said they were not getting the grant, the, the rights across certain airspaces mm -hmm. to be able to operate what they would like. And the model really just became a couple of countries with domestics. And mm -hmm. now I think it's just even Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, and it's fascinating because it was a, a vision of, of people that had created EasyJet. And it proved that you can't just pick one up in one continent and put it in another. Mm. And think, yes. okay, it's the same. It's just, No, it's not. The, the, the yeah. vision is completely different. And rightly now, there would be an opportunity for a fast jet in Africa. But it's it has to then focus on, you know, maybe the cargo is not as important. But if the politics are not going to allow you to have that open skies model the same way we had in Europe when we had, you know, 90, 1992 and the open skies and all of that with the Maastricht that allowed any airline in Europe to be European, it's not as easy just to, to do that model. And that, you know, and that's, yes, why Africa's higher than it is, because so much of it is in South Africa. Mm, yes, exactly. Uh, but no, it, <laughs> What you really want is a pan-African low-cost project that allows people to travel around some of the major cities um, in a what you could call a more cost-effective way. But as you're right, that has political issues later because you might hurt the carrier that the government is is supporting. Excellent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very uh, well, good insights. Thank you very much, well, uh, you. Gavin. Good I think, luck uh, with all yeah. you studying. Uh, good luck with the works. Keep going. Yeah, thank you. Thank you guys for uh, attending this afternoon. I uh, hope you enjoyed the uh, session with uh, Gavin and um, great. Then um, I think we are um, at the end of this session, session. So feel free to leave, guys. Thank you very much. And I'll see you tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you, Brav. Thank, thank you, Dr. Doric. Uh, have a nice day. Thank you for the lecture. Uh, thank you. I, I would. Thank you. Right, Eric. Well, I'll I'll leave you as well. We'll uh, we'll catch up on the WhatsApp in the next days. Let me know if you need anything for this. If you the slides, you can no problem send them to one people. Okay. Thank there was, you. There was a few yeah. I didn't use, but no, not a problem. I I pretty much got through what I needed to. Yeah. It was really interesting. It's just uh, I would have loved this to be kind of a two-hour session but the um the setup um yeah,